Hi, I'm Joe Lindsay. Welcome to How's the Form, a podcast for men in, let's say, the second half of life, like myself, over 50. How's the Form is brought to you by AGNI and is part of the Good Vibrations Over 50s Men's Health Programme, which is funded by Movember. My guest this week is a motorbike road racer with multiple international podium places, a Grand Prix and three Northwest 200 victories under his belt. After becoming ineligible for mainstream racing almost 10 years ago because of his age, he still continues to ride crazy fast bikes competitively. He's also worked with Hollywood A-lister Scarlett Johansson. So Jeremy, how's the form? Great, thanks Joe. Yeah, all good. Good. All good. How's your health? You keeping right? Very good, yeah, actually, yeah. As good as I've ever been, yeah. Healthier than I've ever been, I, I feel anyway. I feel mm. I'm, I'm fit for anything, yeah. Now, we're going to talk about the various injuries you've had over the years. <laughs> but I want to talk about the most recent one, because I follow you on Instagram. Right. September, you had a shot of your back in the shower. I've never seen bruising like it. I'm, I'm amazed you actually walked into a room today. What happened? <laughs> Uh, I just said, you know, it's part and parcel of what happens when you're you're still racing. You know, I'm racing in, uh, it, it was in Coda which is uh, Texas, you know, and it's a great, great circuit. Love the place, fighting for a championship. Um, I'm one point, I think it was one point behind going into the into that uh, last round, but it's called Super Hooligans, with my teammate. And I really needed to beat him on that day to kind of give me an, enough of a, at least get a chance to win the day after. Mm. Unfortunately, in the last corner, flicked, hit the wrong gear in third gear instead of second. Clutched it on the way out, high side it, and uh, it just flicked me badly. You know, I, I, I got a, a trap nerve in my back, and I, as you saw, the bruising was pretty yeah, bad. Yeah, it looked excruciating. I managed, like... managed to get a couple of small fractures in the tibia as well out of it, somehow, and nipped, you know, the the little meniscus in my knee. So it was it was a bad one. I feel a lot better now, but for about four weeks, I I thought I was never going to get over it. Yeah, you're very blasé about all these injuries. I mean, you've, I mean you've, you've you've done you've had some, you've had broken ribs, you've dislocated your collarbone, you've had a variety of injuries over the years. But I mean, kind of as you get older, we don't bounce as well, <laughs> do we? You know what I mean? See, I don't believe that's true at all. I I, I think that you know if if, if you're mentally uh, up for the, the job, you know you're gonna you're gonna and you're physically fit enough to do it, then you know you can get over anything. I raced the next day after that. After that injury, you know, we'd, I didn't go to the hospital because I knew you'd, if I did, they'd probably say, well, you better not race. Um, I waited until I got home and got the MRI scan a full week later here in Belfast. But I raced the next day and finished second, and that got me the second in the championship. So I think if you're if you're willing to, you know, see through the that that short period of pain, you can you can kind of overcome anything. It's 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 down to the person and it's down to how much you want it. It's down, you know, it's been the so the same the whole way through my career. If you step off your motorcycle because you're injured, somebody's going to step onto it and take your ride. That's just the way it works. And you know, if you don't want somebody stepping in and doing a job at least as good as what you're doing or maybe slightly better, yeah. would be the worst thing ever because they take your ride. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's that's just been the way it's been the whole career. So you made it sound like just like competitiveness can sort of overcome all this. I mean, I've always believed motorcycle racers are a breed, a unique breed amongst everyone. Because it's like, I mean, it's one of the most dangerous sports in the world. And if you have an injury, I mean, if anybody has like even a minor car accident, they have a sort of a, you get a trauma from it. So how do you, I mean, how do you kind of mentally, how have you mentally built yourself up over the years that if you have an injury like that or an accident like that, you can get back on the bike? It, it, it is, uh, uh it's it's more of a need to get back. You've got to get back on, and you, you know you you prefer to get back on. Particularly if you've had a fast crash, you're better to get on the bike as soon as possible, and you know repeat what you're doing without crashing this time, because mm. that way it won't affect you. You know if you if you leave it or you take a, a month or two off, trying to get back to it would be more, much much more difficult. Um, plus, the difference is that when you're in sport. You know, you, you don't get time off. You don't get sick leave. You don't get a couple of months to recuperate. Mm. Unless you broke up a femur or something, which I'd, I'd done, and that took me probably... I got out of, Chris, I got out of the Royal on Christmas Eve because I wanted to be home for Christmas with the boys and stuff. And I was back testing in Doha and Qatar uh, on the 2nd of February or something like that, you know, f about 
four or five weeks after breaking my, having my femur repaired again for the second time. That when they did it in Spain, they did it wrong, came back here, they picked it up here at the Royal and said, now I'm going to have to do it all again. I said, look, I don't want to spend Christmas in, ho in, in hospital. And they, they did it and had me in and out in a day, which is incredible for a, wow. you know, to have a, a femoral rod put in. Um, but we have, you know, the, the best, the, 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 certainly the Royals. I, I rate it as one of the best in the world. And it's it's just a matter of of having to get back at it because you need to, and and that's where that's that's how you you know you earn your wage. You know you mm -hmm. you're not not earning anything, sitting at home waiting to recover, and you'll probably lose your ride, and somebody else will fill in whilst you're doing that, and you know possibly take your ride. So it's been a more of a um, uh, a requirement to get back on the bike and get back on as quickly as you can, and, and just get on with it. Would you say this is an obsession? No, I'm I'm certainly obsessed with with the because it seems to be any 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 proof I've ever read about any anyone that races motorcycles that seems to be prevalent in their life. Everything else kind of comes second to. I think the obsessive part of it is when you're doing really well and achieving things that you probably never would have expected to achieve in your life. You know, standing on podiums at world level or winning a race at Northwest 200, which I never thought I'd ever get the chance to do, and then I win three of them or something, you know, and and, and just doing the podium, you know, six times or whatever it is, I can't even remember. Um, that For that sort of the, the history side, but I don't really, I don't count up how many times you do that and do that. You just, like, standing on the podium there or or winning at Daytona a couple of years ago when I, when I won, and actually it was 2022, when I won at Daytona, uh, on the baggers and that and that, that that new class again, things like that. I think you're obsessed with trying to repeat those incredible experiences. Not a, not obsessed about about you know just racing for the for the fact of racing. A, a, a racing is a is a, a means to an end, and it, it 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 obviously keeps a roof over our head. But it also all of those amazing experiences that come with it are the reason why racers and like myself and. All the guys from here all want to get back on the bike. What do you want to take on board, right? No, I'm six. You look, you look great on it, right? You're nearly sixty. Yeah. And yeah. you're still racing motorcycles at what 180 miles an hour. Yeah, at least you know the, this. I'd say you know if, if you jump on a stock bike at the Northwest 200, you know, which there's a very good chance I'll do again yeah. in 2024, you'll, you'll be sitting at 200 miles an hour on it. But it's it's nothing to do with the speed of it. That that that's completely. I know it sounds. A bit to the lay person, yeah, but, yeah. This but to, to us, it's like you know, you're not even thinking what speed is this. Mm. It's only afterwards when somebody says, "Oh yeah, you went through the speed trap at 204 miles an hour, whatever it might be." You go, "Oh really? Okay, well, I'll say cheers for that." There's, it's not. There's nothing really. It's it's really to do with how you know how successful you are in the race, or qualifying, or whatever it might be. The, the speed's got nothing to do with it. it it's just uh, it, it doesn't look any different. Like. Mm. Speeds of 160 doesn't doesn't look any different than a 200. It's it's see you're the saying this as a professional. To me, it's like that just sounds insane to me. Not in a bad way. It's like to travel at 160 miles an hour with just this engine, two weights. That's incredible. Like that is an unbelievable feat. You know what I mean, I know you're kind of because you've been doing this for so long, and I, like all like, that's why I'm saying you're a different breed of human being. Motorcycles are a different breed of human beings. Uh, uh, maybe in some in some ways, but it's the same, you know, as as a driver, you know, a Formula One driver, or a you know, or a, a rally driver like Chris Meek or whatever. To you know, what what, what they can achieve yeah. on four wheels is something that I couldn't do, you know, or you couldn't do, yeah. and what I do, you know, they couldn't do. So yeah. it's 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 just horses for courses, and I think if you've done it for so long, it. It becomes just second nature. Yeah, it's a bit like honestly, it's it's like going to work. It's like you coming in here to work and doing it exactly as you do it right now every single day. We're just doing the same thing. Yeah, we're just repeat. Come in and make sure you're on top of your game, making no mistakes. Um, there's no gamble in in this. It's all calculated. You know what we do on the track or on the road is it's it's all calculated very very perfectly. Yeah. You know, you can ride at those speeds in the wet, and we do. You know, when when the place is absolutely still, soaking wet up there, you still do the same there's thing. There's still a high level of danger here. There's there's obviously a level of danger with everything, though. Yeah. So I and I can't say that there's one thing or the other that uh, it, it. You know, of course, 
anything can go wrong, but it can go wrong every day walking across the street. Once the flag drops, everything's dead simple from there. It's it, it's all it's almost like it's in slow motion. It's and you know you've got time when you're sitting at the 160 or 170 miles an hour to look at each other, to look at your opponents. But you know as you're heading out to university, which we do often, trying to weigh each other up, and you know there's there's all of that time on the motorcycle at that speed to do that. Uh, and uh, you, know, you never feel like you know you're risking anything by by doing that. It's just a it's, it's just a natural reaction to the the situation at the time, you know. And you know you're going to get passed two or three times in the way out there, and you're going to have to pass back again. It's about trying to set yourself up in the right position at the right place before you turn up towards the roundabout, for instance, at the northwest, or same at Daytona, coming onto the banking at Daytona up near the wall, making sure you're high. Making sure you get the, the drive down, so you've got the draft to, to pass at the line. It's all you're you're continually using your race brain mm. to to calculate the situation. Which and I, I guess maybe that's part of what's um, obsessive for me too about yeah. about being clever at that. Where did this start for you? How did you get into this? We went racing Irish Championship, won the Irish Championship, and Robert encouraged me to go to England and ride a bit more over there in the British Championship because it's a higher level again. Winning a couple of races over there quite quickly led on to why don't we try a European race? Did a couple of European races and all the time this was going on, you know, I was getting watched by other guys in the background, one being Joe Miller from Randallstown, mm. who owned Miller Transport, who had a Grand Prix team. He phoned me one day, you know, this is two years after being with Queen's University and said, uh, would you come and race for me at World Championship uh, on a 500 Yamaha, which I'd never ridden before? You know, jumped into that and completely out of my depth. Absolutely, you know, useless at it. <laughs> Even though you do, you know, and and you do, you do believe that you're when you're winning over here that you know you're 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 definitely the best things in sliced bread. You know, you you know you go anywhere and you could ride at any level. Of course, going to World Championship and jumping on a five hundred was a different thing altogether. Like, it, and I I struggled for the first year and then came back in the second year. I came back a lot a, a different person, different mindset, much fitter. Um, and and carried on. I remember, you know, at the time after the first year, saying, "This is not for me. This is this is like I'm I'm useless at this. I'm out of my depth." Mm. You know, and and even having the conversation at home, saying, "You know, there's a good chance I'm, I'll not come back from this. It, it is that hard, and it's that dangerous." And but I'd made my, my bed, and you know, I kind of had to lie on it. So back out again the next year, and then I had a, a decent year finishing. A lot, quite a few top tens, which is a big thing at World Championship. Yeah, yeah. And then we did four years on the five hundred, and then moved to two fifty, and started, you know, finished sixth in the World Championship, cup some podiums. This is on machinery, still supported by the way with Queen's University. They yeah. they followed me through this career and 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 helped along with a, an American uh, sponsor, Optimum um, Technology, and they basically are Optimum Power Technology. They they came along and supported that whole drive when we went back to 250 and the jumping from the 500 back on to 250 kind of really kind of started the career you know really got the career up and going uh if it stayed on the 500 you know as a privateer and not finishing in the top 15 it might have you know i, I wouldn't have been racing for as long as i've raced now so you know so big thanks to all those sponsors back in, in those days mm -hmm. that, that have supported and and I got me on that uh, that ladder to success, and then Aprilia picked me up, the factory picked me up, and you know we we had a couple of ups and downs years again. And uh, Kenny Roberts rode for Kenny, you know the King Kenny Roberts from mm. America. So there's there's been a lot of um, the the career in in World Championships is was was kind of up and down, but we had some really decent years, and that led on to everything that came afterwards, right racing in America. Back in British Championship again, um, you know, even getting an invite to come and race at my age in America was all because of those, those decent years, those good mm -hmm. years in in world level. So uh, you're just trying to you're building up this portfolio as you go through yeah. life, like you would in any job, and and you know you get a name for he, he he's a great uh, test rider, he get you know good feedback, and and manufacturers or teams look for that as well. Yeah. And that's kind of where, you know, how I've managed to, I guess, keep going as long as I've yeah. going and still racing at the moment. Let's take a short break there and head over to the doctor's surgery for a reminder about some ways we can be a little bit healthier. 
I'm Dr. Alan Stout and I'm a GP. If I can share one thing, it's this. I see far too many men coming in too late. If men would just get checked out by a doctor a bit sooner, I know for sure that lives could be saved and men's health improved. So I'm gonna share some of the things men should look out for and why they matter, and most importantly, what to do about them. Today, let's talk about diabetes. You've probably heard of it, but you might not know what it is, how to spot it or how to prevent it. Firstly, diabetes causes a person's blood sugar to become too high. When too much blood sugar stays in your bloodstream over time, this can cause serious health problems like heart disease, vision loss, kidney disease, and circulation issues which affect, for example, the feet, which can eventually lead to amputation. So what are the signs of diabetes? These will include things like feeling very thirsty, peeing more frequently than usual, particularly at night, feeling very tired, weight loss and a loss of muscle bulk, itching around the penis, cuts or wounds that heal slowly, and blurred vision. Diabetes needs to be diagnosed as early as possible because it's likely to get worse if it's left untreated. If this sounds like you, act fast and please see your GP. You may have heard of type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Type 1 is genetic, type 2 on the other hand can be very preventable. The risk of developing type 2 diabetes increases as you get older, so the earlier you start on prevention, the better. The main things you can do to lower your chance of developing type 2 diabetes are to eat more healthily and to keep a healthy weight and to move and exercise more. Moving more doesn't mean you have to go to the gym. Aim to walk quickly or do something that will get you a little bit out of breath for about 30 minutes or so on at least five days of the week. If you're short of time, do it in three 10 minute slots. Break up long spells of sitting at a desk or lounging watching TV by stretching or moving more often. And with minimal effort, most of us can manage to walk more and sit less. Stopping smoking and sticking to government guidance from alcohol units can also help you reduce your type two diabetic risk. Many serious conditions are preventable and with early detection, many are treatable. If you're in doubt, please make an appointment with your GP and get it checked out. HNI's Good Vibrations programme is for men over 50. If you or someone you know could use some advice or support on health, well-being or mental health, there's lots more information online at hni.org forward slash I connect. That's letter I, C-O-N-N-E-C-T. Or visit agni.org forward slash good vibrations to sign up for monthly emails with expert tips and information. Remember, it's okay not to feel okay. The HNI Good Vibrations team are here with help and support. You seem to be quite a maverick within the sport. You know, 2014, you were told you couldn't race because you were, you were hitting 50 and you refused to, to sort of <laughs> to take true. that. So you, and you always seem to have this kind of maverick spirit through it. You kind of trust your own instinct. You trust your own belief in this. When that happened, I mean, how did you feel when you were told you're too old to do this? We've got very good at, at maintaining levels yeah. of fitness. You know, where, where, where many years ago that wasn't the case. The physical toll it has on you, I mean, you, you, physically, your body would react very differently to a lot of other sportsmen. For example, like, what is your heart rate like when you're racing? It does get up there. Um, right. my, my, my resting heart rate is not particularly low, not not like super low, like a super athlete. I'm no, no super athlete, don't claim to be, but the I, I know I, I can peak and I still peak. You know, this this age thing minus whatever it is to, to work your heart rate out doesn't work, you know, definitely doesn't work for me because my, um, I peak at 195 or something, 196. So when we're, we're, when we're yeah. doing that run over the cave or whatever, you know, at some point, you know, you're going to get into the 190s, 195. Yeah. Uh, when you're racing, it, it's averaging about 170. Right. So it goes up, at, you know, it, it'll be at 140 at some point, but it'll go into 100, maybe 75, 180. So maybe average or 165 to 170 over the race. A funny story, I was racing the Northwest 200 way back in, must have been 16, possibly. And the BBC decided to, to do it, uh, take three athletes and put uh, heart rate monitors on them and check them yeah. and then record it, record the data and have a look at it. You know, a doctor looked at it afterward. And I think during that race was 170 average, wow. but it was a wet race, so it shouldn't have been that high. But I think your heart rate elevates because there's more 
maybe oh. it, you, you, it's certain you're a little bit more on edge when it's a wet race, mm -hmm. so your heart rate's probably a little, a little bit higher. And then uh, a young rider was dicing with me the whole way and subsequently crashed in front of me at Black Hill. And as he went down, I, you know, I kind of knew he was going to go down because he's in the wrong line. Yeah. And, you know, I, you got to use a, a lot more lean angle. If you don't come into Black Hill on the right line, he came up the inside of me. And as he came up the inside of me, he has to use more lean angle, wash the front. And then my heart rate spiked. But, you know, you don't know at the time. You don't realise yeah. it. Came back in and uh, I won the race. Came back in, they took the, the all the way, analysed it and said, you know that you spiked at 125? Sorry, 225. Jeez. So I didn't realise that that was a yeah. thing. You know, that that instant fear, or whatever happens, you know, that, oh, he's going to take me down too. Yeah. Because that's what, obviously what's going through your head and spiked at 2, 225 or whatever. So you see this lovely average heart rate and then this big spike yeah. where, where, where it flies through the roof. Um, and uh, so that's that's so I didn't realize that that's that, that's a thing, but yeah, you, you can you can spike when you get a real fright, you can really really spike. Yeah. Does that so that freak you out? I did a wee bit at the time. I because you know, you think uh, the highest I've ever seen, I thought I had a high heart rate 190, whatever it is, in mid 190s, and uh, all of a sudden you, you see something that's 30 higher than that again. You think, oh my goodness, that surely that's got to be bad for you. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> more than somewhat, <laughs> I say. Yeah. But they, they, I think they just said, "No, it's that that, that is that's a, that's a thing. It's a normal thing. You, you know, you just had a, a a real fright at the time." Wow. Do you still find it as easy to maintain your fitness? The older no, you get? it's not. It's never easy. And it's never much fun. <laughs> yeah. you know, you've got to you've got to go out and make yourself. You know, get get stuck in. I train with uh, Alistair Seeley, right? Most successful Northwest racer. Yeah. You know, and he's also he's in his mid you know forties, and and so. The two of us are very good for each other because we're, we motivate each other a lot. Yeah. You know, we're out riding trial bikes all day yesterday, you know, right. for quite a few hours, and it was hard work in that weather. But that's the sort of thing. Now we'll be back in the gym, you know, we we'll go to circuits, we'll go to circuits three or four times a week. We'll go and run over the cave hill. And he said, why do you run the cave hill? I said, because if you run it without stopping, so if you park at Belfast Castle and you can run up over that hill, at my age, I think you could probably do most anything without yeah. stopping. So you've got to, the idea is that you park the car and you run right over the very, very tall of it, come back down again and do it again, maybe. Flapping it. And you do it twice. Yeah, I've done it twice. It, the last time I did it with Alistair, we did it, we did it once the last time I did it, and he's now going, right, when are we doing this again? When are we doing this again? So it's a, it's a brilliant um, mental you know I, I, however you want to call it but it's uh, you're preparing yourself mentally to, to, to be able to do anything so if we leave, leave the gym you know I, I some days I leave the gym and then go to the cave hill and then run it and then go home and uh, I think if you can do that at my age there's no reason why you, can't, why you can't go and ride a motorbike you know? yeah but that's an astonishing level of fitness I think for any it's just an astonishing level of fitness you also appeared in one of the, the, the greatest British horror films of all time, <laughs> Under the Skin. How did, how did that come about? I mean, you're in like one of the most astonishing sequences I think ever put on film as well. So, I mean, but how did this actually happen that you, you appeared in the movie? I, I thought it was a wind up to begin with when I had a phone call from the director or from the casting director. And she said, um, we've been watching you closely and the, the director <coughs> would like you to be part of this this movie that he's creating, this sci-fi horror. And I said, yeah, really? And, you know, looking around, going, where's, where's this going? You know, and, and she said it was Jonathan Glazer. And I just, I, I kind of thought it was one of my mates winding me up. And uh, I said, so who's in the movie? And she says, well, it's a Scarlett Johansson. <laughs> and then I really thought that somebody was winding me up. Yeah. And, I, and this went on for a bit, you know, talking to the, to the, to the casting director. And she said, look, I'll get Jonathan to, to Skype call you. And, I'm thinking, yeah, you know, I'm sure this is going to be, you know, one of my one of my mates on Skype, and of course it was Jonathan Glazer. And then he said, uh, "We think you're the right person for the job." And I thought, well, what is the right person for the job? What are you looking for? What, what, why why are you calling me? And he said, ah, "You have a let's just say you have a look that would fit the part." Um, and you know, I guess he, he he wasn't talking about my very good looks. <laughs> I think he's well, you're 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 a dashing looking man. <laughs> Gotta say, you know, he probably talked more about uh, you know. <laughs> the, I said, so what's it? What what's the, the character? He said, well, it's a bad guy. I said, oh right, okay. So something yeah. that doesn't that doesn't actually look, 
you know, not a, not a pretty boy for for the the job. And he said, look, if you've got a look, and we think that you can do the job because we we know what you can do on a motorcycle. And there's a lot of fast scenes on motorcycles, you know. And I'm, I still think there's a wind up, by the way. And he and he goes, uh, get so much often. Glazer would do that, wouldn't yeah, he? He decided just phone some guy up no, would you? for a wind up. And he said, <laughs> now can you put a pair of leathers on and walk up and down the the living room for me? And at that point, I'm I'm, I'm laughing. I'm going, yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah. And he, he said, look, you don't need to do it now. He said, get get your missus or somebody to record it on a phone and send it to me. So I get dressed in my leathers and I'm walking up and down. The, the, we've got an open kitchen in the in the living room, quite a big room, and Jill's video on it. I feel like a, 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 an absolute idiot. And, of course, the next thing my best mate walks through the back door and starts laughing, and I think, ah, oh, that's it. That was a wind up. He goes, "What are you doing walking up and down your house with leathers on?" And I said, "Was, was it you put? Did you put him up to this?" And he goes, "What are you talking about?" So it was. It, it, it actually was. It was real. So I ended up agreeing to do it, and uh, we spent like forty days or whatever in the Highlands of Scotland, to mm. and from some days in the studio in, in London. But it was quite a harrowing experience. You know, it wasn't a lot of fun doing it. In the middle of winter, yeah. I mean, yeah, of course, the, there's parts of it that are fun. You know, when you get the scene right, when you've when you've got it, and you know it's you've got it, and everybody goes, "Yes, yeah. that that's it." Of course, that you get there's a there's a level of of uh, enjoyment out of that. You know, and you get okay, that, that that worked well. Oh, I'm glad that that's perfect. But some of the other scenes, and you've watched the movie, yes, you know, I love it, it. Some of it is, uh, you know, the kid on the beach and stuff, yes. where I've just got to walk past and yeah. ignore it and. You know the the scene at the end when where they're burning scarlet. You know yeah. so that's it, some of the stuff was like. Where's that? Glazer's like you know for your first foray into, into being in a movie. Jonathan Glazer's not the most conventional film director in the world. No, he's not. And you know he would <laughs> he would not he wouldn't tell us what we're going to do. He right. said right, you're going to attack him, but we're not going to tell him. So the element of surprise, and you know they do the same thing on me or. You, you, you never knew what you're going to turn up to on the day of of shooting. It was just like, okay, what we're we doing today. Now he's, he'll tell you when you get there, when you're about to do it, or he might might not even. Tell. Okay, just go from there to there. I remember doing some scenes, you know, with a at a stunt double with me all the whole time, and you're thinking, why have we got? A, why do I need a stunt double? You yeah, know? that seems weird. You know, and that, and in the end, they, they they actually didn't need him. I said, well, I'm, I'm not going to crash. And by the way, you know what I'm doing. I can't do the stunts that he does and he can't do the stuff that I do, so it doesn't really work. And it, in the end, we had to get somebody else who was faster to do the camera work and we brought a friend of mine from Scotland to do the very fast bike-to-bike -bike scenes in the pouring rain mm -hmm. in the in the middle of that the That is an astonishing yeah. sequence, though. Uh, yeah, and Amazing that, sequence. that was a fun scene, I think, to do. Yeah. A bit, you know, it was a bit sketchy. It was pouring. Mm -hmm. We were in. It's four o'clock in the morning and... We're blasting up the motorway at 170 miles an hour, you know, bike to bike, yeah. you know, avoiding the traffic. And that was, uh, it, it was quite a funny one to do. And See, again, you're making this sound easy. To the rest of us, this just sounds... <laughs> yeah, to me, that's just... <laughs> the maddest thing ever. That, that's just bread and butter, you know, that, that that's that, that's a yeah, pretty easy you. one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, it, was a, it was an easy enough scene to, to do because we knew exactly what we had to do and how many minutes we had to do it in. Mm. So just write as fast as you can in, in the time frame you've got before the camera runs out of battery life. That was that was it. But it, it was certainly, it was an experience that I, I'm glad I did, but would I do it again? I probably wouldn't because mm. I take myself away from so many other things that, you know, I've got so many other things going on in life. You know, I've got marketing with KTM where we're launching the bikes that I work on, which is lovely. So you get to see, you know, the fruit of your labors being launched to the world's press, everybody riding it, getting off it and thinking, wow, I love this. Mm -hmm. Love your new ideas on we've got wheelie control and all those sorts of things that we're that we're um, that we've brought to one of our new models, and you know even what we're doing last week with Bridgestone tires again, lovely, just a really really good five days on track with dealers and with uh, World's Press coming to to see the new tire. Yeah, you know, there's a, there's a lot of enjoyment out of that stuff, and you know, I I don't, wouldn't want to take myself away from all that again mm. because you've got to, you know, take three months off all of that to go and do this, uh, you know, a movie because it's it doesn't just run day to days. You know, you you clear off and you're on standby for a week, and then you bring they come back again. Oh no, it's not good enough. The light's not good enough this morning. Uh, we'll just wait until tomorrow morning. Mm. <laughs> you're going what? Just wait, like just wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah just just wait. And they come the next day and they're going, no, it's not quite right yet. No, we're waiting another day. <laughs> I can't write. I, that's that, I think that side of it, as an actor, I'm sure they 
it must be very, very difficult. You know, we spent more time sitting in the pub in, in the Highlands, sipping whiskey with Scar- Scarlett Johansson and, because there was nothing wrong. It was a tough day. <laughs> it was all right. Oh, oh, harrowing, I would imagine. But yeah, you know, which she's, a, she's a lovely, lovely down to earth person. Yeah. You know, and, and as soon as everything was over and done, she's going like, right, okay, who's for the bar? Say the bar, such and such a time, it all turn right. up and have a laugh. And But you might have been snowed in. Like, mm-hmm. I, I remember getting snowed in. We were snowed in there for three or four days and not able to do anything. You know, you're, you're there with a motorbike. Yeah. Your motorbike and snow doesn't really mix. No. But, you know, Jonathan Glazer would make me ride it. I remember we, we had to put, we had put tie wraps around the tire around the wheel so that I could ride the motorbike in the snow so that he could get the scene. I remember thinking, this is nuts. This, this is you're, nuts. You're still a very, very busy man. Do, do you think that kind of keeping busy is the key to sort of staying young and staying sharp and all that? I think, yeah, you've got a, uh, if, you, if you've got a mind of a, a 29-year-old like I have rather than a 59-year-old, then, of course, it, it's easier if, I think if you succumb to it, if you if you think God, I'm getting near, I'm getting near retirement age here, then then of course you know you're going to start thinking, well, let's start slowing down. Mm. Um, as you remind me, I'm getting near retirement age. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I, I find it amazing. You, you don't strike me as someone who would even think of the phrase retirement age. I can't imagine you retiring. But I'm like I know a lot of people who are in their well in their sixties and and early 70s that, that don't want to start working. Why would they? Because yeah. it's where they get their their kicks from. You know, that whatever it is they do, they're enjoying it. If you love your work, then carry on. If you don't love your work, then, you know, don't do not do it, but or go and do something else or retire. But, mm. uh, you know, the guys that I'm talking about, people who I've had this conversation with, what are you going to do? Well, I'm, you know, I'm just going to keep... I'm just going to keep working, and you know, until they drop. You know that, that that's the kind of attitude they have, mm. and some of them have had had done that. You know, but I, there's you know sitting at home, uh, reading a book or you know looking out the window doesn't do an awful lot for me. I'm always looking for the next right where are we off to next, and then then that that kind of adrenaline rush starts and that buzz starts, and you're you know you're you're on your way to go and do something else again, which is it's kind of what. You know, I would miss. You know, what, what's what? It's what's motivating me at the minute to keep to keep on top of things that I can keep doing that. So, mm. I hope to be doing it for quite a while. You know, to come yet, but you know, who knows? Who knows what's around the corner? Does like stress come into play with you? I mean, after like a after a race, or even after a season, you must have to kind of decompress a little bit. I think uh, that was more so during you know the MotoGP years. You know, and I'm sure. Like, you know, Jonathan Redham and he's going through it too, you know, love, lovely wind down at the end. You can see, you can nearly hear them taking a, a sigh of relief when the, when the season's over. It was the same mm-hmm. with us because we did like four flyaways at the very end of the year. You'd have been in Japan, you know, Brazil, Argentina, uh, Australia. You know, it, it would have all, and, and you'd have had to combine all those at the end. So at the very end of a season when you're already, you know, maybe carrying a couple of, or you know injuries or whatever, and then you've got to do this, this back to back thing. As soon as that was over, it was like, phew, thank God that's over with now. It's it's hard hard work, yeah, mm-hmm. and it's it's very very hard to, um, when you're out there if you've had a particularly like one or two bad events, it's hard to get through the whole four events one after the other if if it hasn't started well. So mentally, it's a bit of a torture, and then when it's over, yeah, you do you. you you let your hair down, you, you go out and have a party and, mm. you know, and do do the, the normal things that you would do. And and then quite quickly, you might, might have three weeks or four weeks off and you got to start thinking about the next season again. This is a life of absolute dedication. This is this is vocational almost. It's bound to have an impact on your home life and social life and all that. It it does a little bit, but I think you can catch up with that very quickly. You know, as soon right. as you come home and you're home for a week, you're thinking, OK, uh, let's, let's go and do something Let's go down to the Christmas market. Let's let's go out for a bite to eat. Yeah. Um, let's catch up with friends and let's let let's get on the trial spikes like it. You know we we would do every weekend when I'm home. Yeah. Go and compete at a trial at a at an Irish event. You know some somewhere uh, in in a wet mountain somewhere, which is hard work. But that that that's that social side of it's lovely. You, of course, when you're away, you're so busy. You know you're not missing any of that. But when you come home, it's nice to catch up with it. Of course. Um, Sometimes you're only home for a week and off you go again. Right. But uh, I, I, I do have just a small group of friends that we always get together and we always make a point of getting together and 
you know, going having a few beers and, and, and you know, maybe food in their house or, or my house or whatever it might be or, or going out together somewhere. But, you know, I, there's there's plenty of time to, to do all of that whenever everything else is stopped. Yeah. I think there's, you know, they're they're all busy enough too. I'm going to miss the racing if it, if it doesn't come back mm. in, in the States, but I can always get my kick at the Northwest 200. Awesome. <laughs> I can't That's imagine up. you ever stopping, but what I can imagine is you can do anything you put your mind to. Yeah, I hope so. I think yeah. anybody can. I think anybody can and should believe in it and should at least aspire to always be just trying to do something better or something new and mm. take it on. I think that's the, the difference. You know, some through my career has been difficult to be, have the self belief that yeah, I can go and do that. But for not not difficult. It's the step where you've got it right. I love. I can do that and believe in yourself and believe that you can go and do it. Mm. You know, it'd be easier to say, no, no, I'll leave, I'll leave that out. But uh, always believe you, you're going to do it. You can do it. <laughs> Have a go at it. For sure. Jeremy, thanks for talking to no me. No worries. Pleasure to meet you. You're welcome. Thank you. Before we finish off today, let's take a minute or two to pause with Owen O'Kean to have some great advice on how we can be kind to our mind. My name is Owen O'Kane. I'm a psychotherapist, Sunday Times bestselling author and former NHS lead for mental health. And today I'm going to be talking about the importance of exercise and mental well-being. Now, before you switch off, I encourage you to stay with me for a minute because I appreciate there's a lot of stuff out there telling us what we should be doing and that can feel a bit preachy. I understand that. But when it comes to mental well-being, exercise is crucially important because what we know is even five minutes a day, can make an incredible difference and here's why. When you exercise, you change the chemistry of your brain. You know, you increase more endorphins and more encephalins and these are the chemicals that make us feel better. It improves our mood and it reduces anxiety levels. So there is enormous benefits for exercising even for a few minutes a day. So if you're not doing any exercise, I'd really encourage you to stop and consider, even if it's just starting with a walk around the block to get started because it will improve your mental well-being. But apart from the chemical changes, we also know that getting out in and about can actually help you change perspective. It's very, very easy to stay on the normal treadmill of everyday life and get caught up with worries and concerns. But we know that when you step out and do some exercise that you can change perspective. And even if you get outdoors for a while every day for a short walk, we also know that being around nature and trees and being out in the fresh air, not only can it reduce your blood pressure, but again, it can improve your mental state. So if you're not doing anything or you're stuck at home and things feel a bit difficult, I'd really encourage you today to consider getting out and about. Start with five minutes, build it up. It will make an enormous difference to your life. So go get those trainers and get out and about. HNI are the local experts on later life. If you or someone you know is struggling to navigate the challenges of life after 50 and need information or advice on benefit entitlements, housing or care for a loved one, call the HNI advice line in confidence 9 to 5 Monday to Friday on 0808 808 7575. That's it for this episode of How's the Form. Hope you'll join us next time. House the Forum is brought to you by HNI and is part of the Good Vibrations Over 50s Men's Health Programme, which is funded by Movember.